In all honesty, I'm truly, truly thankful for Brother Gary. Thankful for this church, man, this, this little church's faithfulness and the ability to allow me to be full-time the way I am, and, and I, I truly appreciate it. It took me a while to get used to that. I've always worked since I was 17, and, and then it made me realize that the labor I'm doing right now, it may not be with my hands, but it's one of the greatest labors that can be done. And uh, it took me a while to get used to it, but I'm, I'm comfortable with it now, and I, I just enjoy it. But uh, Hebrews chapter 3, we'll be looking at the house of God tonight. Hebrews chapter 3. <clears throat> this, this section of Hebrews is going to run from... 3 1 all the way to 10 39. And this section has two parts to it. This first section here, he tells them to consider. And he tells them to consider the apostle and high priest, and that runs from 3 1 to 7 28. And then there's going to be, after that, there's going to be the sum. He said, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Could you, you couldn't ask for a better book, could you? Right? This is the things to consider and everything we've spoken, this is the sum. He's going to give you the sum of it. And that summary runs from 8-1 all the way to 10-39 where he's going to conclude on faith there and then he gives them a section on faith and the final conclusion there from chapter 12 onward. But what he's, what he's going to tell them here in verse number one is to consider two things about Christ Jesus. And what they are to consider is he says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Notice that calling there. Okay, because we're, we're going to, this is important if you're going to understand this stuff. One of the, one of the things I've, one of the things I've learned about, about preachers and modern Americans, man, is they don't, they don't care what the Bible actually says. They don't, it's not important to them. When they get there and they see that partaker of the heavenly calling and our profession, right there in verse number one, they, not a single commentary I've got at the house, not any of them bothered to even seek out what he's talking about. They don't care about the calling or the profession. You know, you know what? They make the whole chapter about them. Right? Every word of God's got to be about me and, and my family. But notice what he says here. He talks about partakers of the heavenly calling. And then he talks about the apostle and high priest of what? Our profession. Now that profession there is not a profession of faith. I mean it is to an extent. But that profession goes back to that calling. And in between that profession and calling is the apostle and high priest of that profession. And so their profession deals, their profession deals with this heavenly calling he's talking about. And this, this calling and this profession has an apostle and a high priest to it. All right? Now come back to Romans chapter 1. Let me show you some things. Romans chapter 1. You're going to leave out of here tonight, man. If you, want to, if you want full understanding of the house of God, you'll have it when you leave out of here tonight. It just depends on whether you want to accept it or not. But look at Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be what? Well, there's an apostle there. All right, look down at, look down at verse 5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship, for, okay, now here's the purpose of Paul's grace and apostleship. You ready for it? You don't have to guess. He tells you in the opening chapter of his, of his epistle, for obedience to the faith among all, what? Nations for his name. Among whom are ye also the called of who? So Paul, as an apostle, was sent out 
He was given grace and an apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations. And he says, you believers in Rome, you are among the called of Jesus Christ. That means through Paul's apostleship and that office given to him, what Jesus Christ was doing was calling out a people from among all nations. Right? Now, if you want to understand the purpose of that calling, you're going to be taught that purpose in Paul's epistles. You don't run the Hebrews with this calling and this profession here. Okay? They, there is a calling and a profession of the Hebrew people. Right? But Paul was sent out through, for, through, through a spe special dispensation of grace given to him to call out of the nations a people for his name. Alright? Now, once, once that thing's been called out, people always... Man, my phone every time, don't it, guys? It, but, but, but the people of the Gentiles that are called out today, people always say Gentile, 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 Gentile. Guys, when you get in Christ, you're not a Gentile anymore. Amen. When a Jew gets in Christ, he's not a Jew anymore. A Jew is not even partaking in this calling and this profession today that Hebrews is talking about. There's a new creature being created in heaven that's neither Jew nor Greek. It's not male, it's not female. It is one new man created for a heavenly vocation in the heavenly places. This is what God had kept secret. You can't find anywhere in the Old Testament where God talks about the heavenly places being inherited by mankind. Nowhere. Every person in that Bible, the nations, got a lot of land in the earth, didn't they? Israel got a lot of land in the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit what? Heaven or earth? There you go. Let the Bible speak. Right? So Paul was sent out as an apostle, and through that apostleship, there were people from among the nations called. All right? Now, what was the purpose of this calling? Look in Ephesians chapter 1. Y'all realize how big the house of God is? Y'all realize how many administrations? I mean, just, just what does it take to run the city of Fairmont? The economy, the, the administration, the ministry just of the city of Fairmont. It's sewage, it's water, it's electricity. The city council, the mayor, the police force, fire departments, all these just to run this little city. How massive do you think the administration of heaven and earth is? When we're talking about the house of God, we're not talking about some little building built by, by a couple of hillbillies that they think some special building. The house of God, look there, well y'all are in Ephesians, look, look at Ephesians 1.9. Having made known unto us, get it now, the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. This is why, because they neglect, Robert Breaker, all of them, they neglect this teaching. They, they claim Paul was our apostle, but they don't believe it. They claim they believe in a mystery, but they don't believe it. Right? Because of this, Dr. Ruckman and all of them claim they believe Paul received a special revelation from God, but then Dr. Ruckman has the body of Christ riding white horses back at Revelation 19. Right? They, I mean, they can't read the book of Revelation without just throwing you everywhere. You're the seven churches. You're the 24 elders around the throne. You're the great multitude of Revelation 7. You're the bride of Christ in Revelation 19. You're the ones riding white horses back in Revelation 19. You're the ones sitting on thrones in Revelation 20. And I'm here to tell you, you ain't none of them. Because your vocation is not in the earth. God made known the mystery of His will. Well, then that means every man standing behind a pulpit today ignorant of that 
is not qualified to be standing behind a pulpit. It's that, it's that simple, guys. And it, they're without excuse. Is it hid? It was. But it's not anymore. God has made it known. What is it? That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both, both, get that now, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. So, the mystery of God's worth, uh, the mystery of God's will concerns two realms, don't it? I, ain't, I didn't make anything just up, anything up. Both, both. That's one, that's two. In order for something to be gathered together in one, there has to be more than one. And what he's doing is in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. That's how the Bible begins. Well, I bet you the mystery of his will has something to do with that. Right? Right? Now, there's a part of the, of the will of God that has been hid from the beginning. Look at Ephesians 3, verse 9. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. That's what Paul's preaching in 1 Corinthians 2. The wisdom of God that's been hidden and kept secret since the beginning of the world. Right? And he says, I have not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man. All right? But notice this. You have an inheritance, right? Ephesians 1.11 says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance according to the purpose of him that worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Well, what's his will? The gathering together of all things in both realms in Christ in one. And you've obtained an inheritance in accordance to that will. Well, that means it's got to be somewhere here. Now, do we have to guess? Look at Ephesians 2. And you. You see it? Ephesians 2, 1. What about me? Look at verse 5. Quickened us together with who? Then what did he do with you? Where did he make you sit? There you go. Not the land promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not the nations. You were raised up, quickened, raised, and seated together with Christ up here. So where do you think your inheritance is? You've obtained an inheritance in Him. Well, where do you think that inheritance is at? It's in the heavenly places. This was the mystery of God. This was the mystery of His will right here. Right? Now you Gentiles, look at Ephesians 2.11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past what? Gentiles, what time passed? Well, I guess I'm not anymore. Read, read what the verse just said. Where in time passed ye? What? Remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. Now look at 3, 2, 19. What are you now? You're no more strangers, nor foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Now if you want to see that household, look at 3, look at 3.15. The whole family where? In heaven and earth. See, there ain't a verse in Ephesians that told you God made you a Jew. But that's how they read it. There ain't a verse in there that says you're Israel or that you're getting Israel's promises. 
it says that God, before He ever made any of this known about Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that before the foundation of the world, He purposed something for us in Christ. And kept it secret, Bill, from Genesis 1-1 all the way up through until He revealed it to Paul some 4,000 years after creation. And it deals with a heavenly inheritance up here by a new creature being created by God. You are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Now what I want you to understand is Hebrews is going to be talking about the house of God, but the house of God is a big place. Right? With many inheritances in it. Many offices. Listen, is the body of Christ one member or is it many members? Does every member have the same office? No, there are many offices. That means in this house there are many offices of administrations in order to run the government of heaven and earth. Amen? And you are going up here because look at what Paul says in Ephesians 4.1 now. And this is going to tie back into Hebrews. I therefore the prisoner of Jesus Christ beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. He just explained it to you in Ephesians 1 through 3. God made plans for you before you ever come into this world. And your plans ought to take a back seat to what God purposed before the world began. Amen. Your career, your, your, your education, everything ought to take a back seat to what God planned and purposed for you before the world began. Amen. I mean that, man. Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. And here's our vocation. Paul just taught you about it in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. That's not the point. This morning, come back to Romans, or this evening, come back to Romans 15. Because we're dealing with Christ, the apostle of a profession and a calling in the book of Hebrews. And you've got to, distinct, you've got to keep these things distinct. Now God's purpose is to give out these inheritances, man, there's... There's all these thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all these administrations and, and offices in the house of God. And God's, God's purpose is to fill all these things in heaven and earth through His Son, the firstborn of every creature. Christ is the Son over this entire house, heaven and earth. And God is going to dispense the, the, the inheritance among those that are in Christ in heaven and earth, and then when in the fullness of times, He's going to gather both into one house out there in eternity to function as one house. Right? When we talk about a man's house, we're not talking about his, his brick and mortar. We're talking about his servants. You know, we're talking about it the way a house used to run. You know, it had servants in it, it had sons, it had daughters, it had farmers in it, it had, it had cattle and people over the cattle, right? The, 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 the house ran kind of like a, like a small country, right? It had economy, it had, men, it had administrations in it. We still use words like this today, house of representatives, the house of Burgess, right? We still use words like this. The Bible's plumb full of this. House of Israel, house of David, house of Judah, house of Ephraim. Are they in, are they in, house of Ahab, right? But they all are in God's house. Every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is who? God. So in God's house are many houses, right? And Christ has a son over this house, but, but notice here in Romans 15, Y'all understand where I'm going with this. We have a vocation also. This calling and profession that's being dealt with in Hebrews chapter 3 deals with a calling and profession down here. 
We just read, we read through this as we come through Hebrews chapter 1 and chapter 2. It deals with the earth. Now look in, look, look in Romans 15. Look at verse 16 first off. That I should be the minister of who? Jesus Christ. Why is people scared of that? Why, why is the world, you say Paul's our apostle today, they act like it's the most dangerous thing they ever heard, but they don't have a problem with Moses being the lawgiver. When God spoke, listen, God's allowed to do that. And if you don't believe he is, take a hint from Miriam and Aaron. Does God speak to Moses only? God said, come here, you two. He said, when I speak to you, I will speak by a prophet, and I will speak to that prophet through dreams and visions. Moses is not so. I speak to him face to face. In other words, I speak to Moses like I don't speak to anybody else. And guess what? If God wanted to, he's allowed to choose a man named Saul of Tarsus to be a chosen vessel to dispense information he had kept secret since the world began. And that ain't nothing. Listen, if God did that, it's your prerogative to be obedient to it. Not to sit down here and butt heads against it. Paul said he was the minister of Jesus Christ to you Gentiles. He just said that. Well, who was Jesus Christ then? Well, look at Romans 15, 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the, the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. That means Jesus Christ was a minister to confirm the promises made to the fathers throughout Genesis to the book of Malachi. Jesus Christ was the confirmer of these promises back here. There's nothing about the mystery that has anything to do with this right here. Right? Christ was confirming these promises made to the fathers. He was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. Now look at the next verse. And that the who? Well, that ain't you. How many of y'all agree with that statement? See how well you've been paying attention this lesson. That ain't you. In time past, you were Gentiles in the flesh. That's not you in verse 8. Verse 9. You say, oh, of course it is. I'm a Gentile. No, you're not. Listen, listen. We don't know any man after the flesh today. You don't know me after the flesh. If any man be in Christ, he's a new what? Creature. Those Gentiles being spoken about in Romans 15, 9 is not you. Because look at what he says. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is what? Written. Well, let me ask you this. When Paul writes Ephesians 1 through 3, this dispensation of grace to you Gentiles, is it, is it according to what was written? Or was it something that had been kept secret? If you get your Bible straight on these two points, you're going to understand your Bible. I mean it. Paul is talking about the Gentiles after the 70th week of Daniel, when Israel gets their kingdom, the Gentiles are going to, going to glorify God in that kingdom for His mercy shown to Israel. He quotes four Old Testament quotes there. He quotes Psalm 18. He quotes Deuteronomy 32. He quotes Isaiah chapter 11. And I believe Psalm 100 and... I can't remember which one it is. Maybe Psalm 107. But all four of those quotes, if you take the time, I mean, let, 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 let's, let's get, let's, 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 uh, I'm going to be a little bit of a smart aleck here, man. Y'all just forgive me. But let's, let's, let's try something for a change, right? When the Bible says that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written, let's try this revolutionary thing and actually go back and look at what was written for a change. Instead of saying, see there, there's the Gentiles. Go back and read it. 
Every one of those Gentiles, every one of those quotes is after Israel's 70th week of tribulation, after their seven-year tribulation in their kingdom and the Gentiles glorifying God after Israel's kingdom comes to this earth. There, it, ain't, it has nothing to do with you. The Gentiles have a purpose. There's a, there's a plan for the Gentiles. The first promise made to Abraham was in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Right? All families of the what? Where are you seated? There you go. I mean, just let words be words, man. No, I mean, I hope you're understanding this. Look at Romans chapter 11. Because here's another one. Romans eleven twenty six. And so all Israel shall be saved, there it is again, as it is written. Now guess what? See my Bible up here? I don't have any references here. Right? Y'all know where that, you know where, the, as it is written, do you know where that quote's from? This is what's wrong with modern Christianity. I'm being honest with you. Everybody wants a voice. Everybody gets on Facebook starting fights and arguments. You can take them to a simple verse like that. All Israel shall be saved as it is written. And he quotes a verse there. And I guarantee you, all the ones starting fights on Facebook can tell you where the verse is. And it, it's, it's, listen, I, I hate to be like this sometimes, man, but it, it comes to a time, it's like Ruffin used to say, man, don't get me foaming at the mouth. That's Isaiah chapter 59, verse 20. And it's about a covenant coming in which God says, he says that the deliverer shall come to Zion unto them that turn from ungodliness in Jacob. You're not Jacob. The salvation that's coming for Israel, guys, they have a salvation when Christ returns to Zion. Unto them in Israel that have turned from ungodliness and God makes a covenant with them and takes away their sins. It's all through the Old Testament. Peter's preaching at Acts 3. And right before that, he just told you about a mystery concerning Israel at the present time. And this mystery deals with our profession and our when 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 God sent the apostle Paul out it was to call out of the nations a people for his name to inherit these heavenly places in accordance to God's will and purpose before the foundation of the world and we try to educate people about it and they hate us for it they want this stuff here There's a calling. Now when you come to Hebrews chapter 3, I hope you get this, man. You say, why are you so fired up? Because I live in a world, man, where everybody's a Bible scholar and very few people know what they're talking about. And here's what's scary. You want to hear, hear what's really scary? The more I learn, the more I realize how dumb I am. So how dumb's the rest of them? Think about that. Let that set in for a moment. The more I grow in the Lord, the more humble my God makes me. That's why you don't see me making videos, this guy's wrong, and this guy's wrong, and that guy's wrong. That's why you don't see me on Facebook getting in, getting in wars that last for three weeks, man. The body of Christ is supposed to be a self-edifying thing, not a self-destructive thing. And people just, people just they, they, they learn a little bit of something, this is why Paul talked about charity being so important 
in the body of Christ. When I get mean, it's with charity, man. I know that's hard for some people to get their head wrapped around. But when I get aggressive, it's because I love you. And I love the people out here, and I love this book, and I love God. Right? Hebrews chapter 3. So, when you see this word here, calling and profession, you have a calling and a vocation as well. And you had an apostle of that calling and vocation. Jesus Christ is the apostle and high priest of this calling and profession that's being talked about here in Hebrews chapter 3. And this calling and profession here in Hebrews chapter 3 deals with a house. Look there in verse 2. Just read it. Scam over verse 3. Verse 4. Verse 5 and 6. He mentions how seven times in five verses. This calling and profession deals with a house. Right? It deals with his rest in Hebrews 4.1. The promise being left us of entering into his rest. It has a gospel. Now I know this, this, this blows people's minds and I know y'all understand. I hope you understand this. That if you don't get the gospel of the circumcision and the uncircumcision correct, if there's a gospel of the uncircumcision and a gospel of the circumcision, then I should expect my New Testament to have two parts to it. And when Peter's preaching the gospel of the circumcision and you got two books called First and Second Peter, it ain't hard to figure out, guys. That's why Peter's talking about a salvation that was prophesied. And, Paul, and he said it was a salvation the prophet searched. Paul said, I'm preaching to you Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. I'm sorry, guys, if it's unsearchable and searched, they can't be the same. You should expect two gospels in your New Testament because there's two realms and two callings. Guess, guess who gets this inheritance? Guess who gets this one up here? That's what your New Testament is about. God through New Testament redemption has made you His sons and heirs of the world to come. And in that inheritance are two realms of the heaven and the earth. Your vocation and calling is up here. The vocation and calling being dealt with here in the book of Hebrews is a vocation and a calling in the earth. It has a gospel to it. The gospel being preached to them was preached to Israel back in the book of Exodus. Read Hebrews 4 too. For the gospel was preached unto us as well as unto who? Them. Oliver Green missed it. Right? I think Ruckman got it right, if I remember correctly. Well, who's the them? We know who the us is. It's the Hebrews being written to here. But who's the them? The them was their fathers in the wilderness from chapter 3. Meaning the gospel being preached here in the Hebrews of entering into his rest one day was already preached to Israel back in the book of Exodus. And to get that thing confused with what God sent Paul to preach to the Gentiles during our dispensation is just to make a mess out of your Bible. Right? Right? And so, look there in uh, the apostle of our profession, right? The first thing I want you to notice is the context is about his house there in verse 2. 
who was faithful to him that appointed him as also Moses was faithful in all his house. And this is probably where we're going to have to stop tonight as we talk about this house. I'm going to talk to, to you about it for a few moments. And I don't, probably won't be able to get started into anything else. But the context is about his house. Okay? Now come back to Genesis 28. Now what you have to understand here is like I was telling the brother there, brother, I forgot your name again. What is it? Mike, Mike that's it. As so I was telling brother Mike there before, before church, this idea of going to heaven is a Pauline doctrine only. There is no doctrine. Listen. There's no doctrine about Israel inheriting heaven. Nowhere. Daniel, they, they all had one hope. Resurrection to internally inherit the land that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What, you think God just promised him that land until he went to heaven? He said, I've given you this land for an everlasting possession. That Jew ain't going to heaven. He's going to everlastingly possess the land that was promised to their fathers. Daniel gets an inheritance in it. Moses and Aaron and Samuel and David. They're all going to be resurrected to inherit that land that was promised to their fathers. You and I have a completely different inheritance up here. But look in Genesis 28. Now as you deal with the house of God, the heavenly things are, are a part of a mystery. Look in Genesis 28, verse 10. Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached where? Okay. We're getting somewhere, ain't we? <laughs> this old archaic book, man. This thing will show you things you couldn't get from NASA or anybody else. Look at Jacob understands it. Look what he says. There was a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold the angels of God, what? Notice the first word, not descending, ascending and descending upon it. Well, if they're ascending, where are they starting? Now, where's their starting point? They go up, they come back down. Under whose authority? <laughs> right? Let me ask you this. Are those angels on the earth now or are they in the heavenly places? <laughs> you ever read about the high places? Now, now, this has not been fulfilled yet. Christ told Nathaniel hereafter Shall you see the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man? It ain't fulfilled yet. Now, if they're ascending and descending back to the earth, the book of Hebrews says that these angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who shall be heirs of what? Salvation. Heirs of salvation. Under whose authority? Who's running the show in heaven? What are these angels going up and bringing back? You see, God's keeping something secret. Do you not know we shall judge who? Now I'm going to show you what Jacob, Jacob understands. Look, look at verse 13. Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest to thee will I give it and to thy seed. So now here's Here's Jacob down here sleeping on a piece of land and God calls out that land and said, that land where you're laying right now, I'm going to give it to you and to your seed. 
Oh, they didn't understand the, uh, what, what is it they say? They didn't understand the nature of the kingdom. It was only spiritual. No, it's physical dirt. That's what it is. Right? Look at what he says. Look, come down there when Jacob wakes up. What does he say? Verse uh, 16. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. What place? That land. And he said, the Lord is in here, and I didn't know it. And he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place. You better take heed, O nations. You see, you see, if people just read and believe that book, they couldn't get out of the book of Genesis without getting their head screwed on right. Do you realize how dreadful that land is over there? How many of y'all agree with that statement? That's a dreadful piece of land over there. This is none other but the house of God. Good luck, man. That's all I can tell people. What is that land over there? You, just, you were just told what that land is. It's none other but what? The house of God and this is the gate of heaven. You know what the gate of heaven is? That land over there is said to be the house of God and the gate of heaven. Do you know what that means? The government of heaven is going to be executed in the earth out of that house right there. When you talk about the gate of something, Lot sat in the gate of Sodom judging. When he's talking about the gate of heaven, this heavenly government, and these angels ascending and descending into this land, ascending and descending back, that is God's house and the gate of heaven. The government of heaven is going to be executed out of that land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob one day. All of heaven, all of earth is going to be governed out of that one land over there. God chose it. Didn't he say that? Psalm 132. We're going to be dealing with the rest here in Hebrews 4, right? Y'all still with me or I leave you? <laughs> Man, I hope y'all are still with me. Hebrews 4, we've talked about his rest, right? You know what God said in Psalm 132? This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell. He says, the Lord hath chosen Jerusalem. Here will I dwell. This is my rest forever. So where's, where's God going to dwell? Where's his house going to be? What has he chosen to set upon? He talks about the throne of David and all that. The, the rest of God is when he sets here in Jerusalem and executes the government of heaven and earth out of Jerusalem. That's a special plot over there. Now, it's, 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 this gets into New Jerusalem, and we ain't got time to go into all that. But understand here, Jacob calls this place Bethel because he understands it's the house of God. Look at Exodus chapter 15. The book of Exodus is not a Disney story. And it ain't a Charlton Heston movie. <laughs> Amen. I mean, most, pe most people get the ten plagues and they get the story till the Jews come out of the land. Do you understand what's going on there, though? How many of you knew that God was calling out of Egypt an army? It's in the book of Exodus. How many of you know the book of Numbers is about him numbering an army and giving them, the, the giving, giving them their marching orders? How many of you know the book of Joshua is a book of military conquest going into the land God chose for his house and driving his enemies out of that land? That's what the book's about. It's about possession and military conquest. When Christ comes back on a white horse, he comes to judge and make war. How many of you knew he was coming to make war? In military conquest to take possession of the earth. Look at, look, look at Exodus 15. Moses knows what's going on. 
Exodus 15, 13. Thou and thy mercy has led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy what? Habitation. Well, where's his holy habitation? It's that land, right? Look at what he says in verse 17. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance. In the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in. In the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. So when God calls Israel out of Egypt, and he's leading them to this land, what's he doing? He's leading them into the land of his holy habitation. They are, now look at Deuteronomy 32. He explains it a little bit better. Deuteronomy 32. Say, what are we talking about, preacher? Well, we're talking about somebody's profession in a house. Is that what Hebrews 3 is about? Moses was faithful in all his house. Whose house? God's house. You go all the way back to Genesis. Jacob's leaving the land and he has a dream. This is the house of God and the gate of heaven. The Jews are being led out of Egypt into the house of God. Now look here in Deuteronomy 32 and 8. When the Most High divided to the nations their what? Well, where did the nations get their inheritance at? Let's, let's, let's look at these two realms. I mean, we only got one of two choices, right? Where did the nations get their inheritance? Now see, this, this up here was called out from among the nations. You're not part of the nations anymore. You're not part of this inheritance down here anymore. But God divided the earth to the nations. When he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Amen. And God, God will set it all straight one day. And, and I, I'm going to read you the verses. But, but this, this idea of colonialism and the British Empire and the, the Gentiles just going and shedding blood and conquering land and stealing dirt and you know, then taking God's land and dividing it to whoever they see fit, it's going to stop one day. And they're all going to be put back in their own place. I can show you scripture on that. But when God, when God divided the earth up to the sons of Adam and to the nations, He numbered them and set their bounds according to the number of the children of Israel. Why? For the, get the next part. You see that possessive word there? The Lord's. That's a possessive word. And this is, this is what people better snap into when they start talking about that land of Israel. Well, the Palestinians have a right to exist over there. The Lord's portion is who? You realize what, you realize what Hitler was messing with now? That's God's portion. Jacob is the lot of his what? You know what God's portion and his inheritance is? His people, Jacob, and that land. Look in Joel. I'll show you this. Come to the book of Joel. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, and then I'll prepare you a little bit for next week. Joel chapter 2, verse 18. Then will the Lord be jealous for his what? His what? <laughs> okay. Who's that land belong to? God, right? The Lord. I don't know where that went. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity who? His people. There's the land and the people again. All right, look over in verse uh, 
Look down in verse 19. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his, his what? People. Look back in verse 17. Uh, about Start down there about halfway down the verse. Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage. See that heritage? So look at 3.1. For behold, in those days and in that time. Now, if people believe this, you say, I believe this. I believe these verses, man. Those days and that time. I believe that time and those days are coming. I believe they're real. I believe God has given sufficient warning. Men leave that Bible on their bookshelf at their own peril. Because he gave them warning. Look at what he says. He says, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather who? All what? Nations. And will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel. You know what that means? God is going to make the nations give an account to him one day for how they treated his land, his people, and everything. The judgment of the nations ain't about some southern Baptist woman making some fried chicken for a homeless man on the street. When Christ said, when I sit on the throne of my glory and all nations are gathered before me and I say, when you've done to these the least of my brethren, you've done also unto me. He's pleading with the nations there based upon their treatment of Israel. His brethren. You know what, man? It's so much Bible, we've left 95% of Christianity in the dust today. They couldn't talk about five. They think the house of God is a Methodist temple. Right here is the house of God, man. It's heaven and earth. And the whole government of that thing is going to be operated out of Jerusalem one day. Everything centers around that place where God chose. And so you up here are somehow going to be connected to this also. Right? Y'all follow that? Come back to Hebrews. I'm, I'm going to close. Come back to Hebrews. When we talk about the house of God, I've quoted this verse enough that we ain't got to flip there and read it. Guys, I'm sorry to get so worked up sometimes, man. It's just, don't take anything personal. I just get fired up, man. That's the kind of preachers I listen to, Bill. That's who I grew up, man. Them old, them old red, you know, it's like Dr. Ruckman said. He said, I don't know for the life of me how any red-blooded male can stomach Chuck Swindoll or anybody like that for more than five minutes, man. I like them old, I like them old fiery preachers, man. I can't help it. I get excited about the book. Who can be sitting there holding God's word and be like, oh, dearly beloved, we are gathered here today. You know, you're handling God's word, man. Ought to excite you. Right? And so this, this thing here, man, when, 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 when you start to understand this, the house of God, now, now Hebrews is dealing with a specific aspect of this house. And this is going to set us up for next week. But when we understand the house of God now, Paul talks about that house in Ephesians 3. Paul was the one that was putting in the missing information to help you understand the fullness. Doesn't he talk about the fullness in the book of Ephesians? That you would see the fellowship of the mystery which hath been hid to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to his eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. But he talks about the whole building there in Ephesians 2. Being built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets and all that. When we talk about the house of God, we are talking about a new man being created in heavenly places to inherit the heavenly places for a vocation that God has given us as his sons. 
I don't care what anybody says. You are a son of God today. And as a son, you are an heir. And as an heir, you've got some business to do. Regardless of what anybody else tells you. You ain't going up there to harp a harp, harp and fish in the river of life. You're going up there to run the government of heaven one day. And it's time to start taking that vocation serious. And to begin to let God as your father furnish you unto those good works that he's ordained. Amen? And as this new man goes up here, in the earth you have the Israel of God. The Israel of God is what's going to inherit this land here. Now you up here, you've got the new man up here and the angels. Right? When the earth you got Israel and then who? The nations. Right? The animal creation and all that. I don't, I don't even know what all's up here, guys. What? A satyr, unicorns, <laughs> right? But you, you, when, when you start seeing this, God's plan now is for us to reconcile all things in heaven all things in the earth to be reconciled through what God is going to do in Israel and then the fullness of times He's going to gather both into one with a new Jerusalem that links the two together. I saw a new heaven and a new earth and new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven Who's bride, who is as a bride adorned for her husband. You know what's taking place there? A marriage between heaven and earth. The two are becoming one. And New Jerusalem is going to be the city that operates the government of both realms. That's where the two meet and become one. You know how tall that city is? I mean, if, if the space station's real, and I say it kind of laughingly, but if it is real... The New Jerusalem's up above it. That thing's 1,500 miles high. That's a tall city. Do you think the top of that city reaches unto heaven? Set up on the earth, whose top reaches into heaven? This is the house of God here in its completion. The sons of the earth and the sons of heaven reconciling all things back to the Father. And when Christ, the Son of God, has put all authority and all power under His feet, He delivers that perfect kingdom back to God the Father that God may be all in all. And then we begin eternity. That's the fullness of times. So guess what, guys? You're in the reconciliation phase. Quit talking. Joel Osteen talking about his best life now. He don't have a clue what he's talking about where he's at. You're in the reconciliation phase of this. Man, the age is to come, Bill. When we get out to Revelation 21, you know where we're at? We're in the beginning of the ages to come and what God is going to be doing in the new heaven and the new earth. And so it's going to get a whole lot better. Paul calls it the exceeding riches of his grace. But understand that what you're dealing with in Hebrews here, so this whole thing is the house of God. And we're going to look at this some more next week. And what he's going to show Israel here is that this man, Jesus Christ, he's going to compare him to Moses and he's going to point out two things about him. His faithfulness and his glory. That he was like Moses and that he was faithful in all, his, all of God's house. But that he was, counted more worthy, he was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Inasmuch as he that hath built the house hath more honor than the house. You see, Moses is a part of the house. He's a servant in that house. But Christ is a son. You realize how important that man is? I mean, I don't know what God's going to give me to do when I get there. I guarantee you it ain't going to be his right hand. Right? John and James and John wanted his right hand, the right, hand, right and left hand of the Son. 
If God, if God called you up there right now, let's just pick any of you, just to show you how much better Jesus is than you. If God called you up there right now and said, set at my right hand, I want you to run all of heaven and earth, where would you even begin? The wisdom in that man, the righteousness in that man, God highly esteems the Lord Jesus Christ, and so should you. Because God took him and everything he made, he said, is under your feet. That's a lot of responsibility. But the Father knows how he's going to govern. And then he took you and gave you to his son so that his son could begin filling his kingdom in heaven and earth with believers that love him and are been educated by him and being taught by him so that he can dispense to you positions in that heaven and in the earth one day is when we talk about the house of God, Christ is a son over the whole thing. You have a vocation and inheritance in it, but what Hebrews is dealing with, and this, I hope you understand this, what we're dealing with in Hebrews is the vocation and the calling of the nation of Israel to inherit the land down here that God promised them in the Old Testament where that kingdom of heaven, what's it called? The kingdom of what? Heaven, where that kingdom of heaven is going to be established in the earth and begin to go out and to teach all nations in the millennial kingdom. Y'all understand that? That's good Bible teaching, guys. That's the, uh, did you have a question, Mike? That's, that's the Bible in a nutshell, man. And the great thing about it, man, is that I was an old Gentile, man. <laughs> the exceeding riches of God's grace plucked out us dead Gentiles, man, twice dead. Y'all ever heard that phrase? Rod Jones uses it. People, people look at him like he's crazy. He calls us twice dead Gentiles. And people, people make fun of him for it. Rod has Bible for it. It comes from Colossians. You who were dead in sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. You see, Israel was dead in sins, but they had the circumcision. You were twice dead. You were dead in sin and in uncircumcision. And God took that dead Gentile who was dead in sins and uncircumcision and circumcised him with a circumcision made without hands and cast off that old identity in the flesh and gave you a brand new identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. And your goal should be to learn the knowledge of the Son of God that you may know as you are known. You're known up here now. You are known. Paul said, as unknown and yet well known. I guarantee you, you're well known in the heavenly places if you're in Christ. You may be unknown in the world, but you're well known up here. And I bet you this, man, it, it ought to be your goal to learn about this new man. To know who you are in Christ, to know who God has made you to be in Christ. And to start allowing God to educate you as his son for the purpose of inheritance in the heavenly places one day. The more I understand it, man, the more I'm like Paul. I've got a long way to go in this thing, guys. I mean, I've, I mean you measure me up against the fullness of Christ, I don't measure up nowhere. And I've got a long way to go in it, but here's what I'm starting to, the more God enlightens my understanding to this thing, the more I become like Paul and say, I'm suffering the loss of all things for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, that I may know him and the power, pressing onward to the prize for the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Don't you want that? I do. Amen. Any questions? I promise I'm going to shut up. Next week we're going to get into the faithfulness and the glory that he's talking about there. We won't spend too much more time on the house but just understand in this house are many dispensations of, of I mean, you got the house, the house of David is a part of the house of God, guys, right? 
Is the house of Israel a part of his house? House of, house of Judah? And in, in this government, man, you got lawgivers. Y'all believe that? You got lawgivers, principalities, powers. You got counselors, judges, kings, princes. You're going to have everything down to just common cultivators. There's reapers and sowers in the kingdom. Did you know that? And the reaper's going to catch the sower, Bill. And the ones who, who put it in the wine press, as the, as, the, as the sower's putting the seed in the ground, the ones who make the wine are coming and getting the grapes as they're putting the seed in the ground. That's biblical. You got to, I mean, the house of God is going to operate marvelously one day. And in that house are many houses and many vocations and many administrations. And the book of Hebrews is dealing with Israel's profession and their calling in the house of God. All right, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this day, God. I, I pray, Lord, that, that, that people would be able to overlook my, my, my tone and my mannerism sometimes, Father, and just understand that I'm just passionate about this book that I, I, I love the things that you've shown me, Lord, over a period of 20 years, God, and how much I'm humbled by the great treasures that I've yet to find in this book. God, the more you open my eyes to understand these things, the, the, the greater the peace and the hope and the assurance and the, the great love of Christ is shed abroad in my heart, knowing the great calling that you purposed for us in Christ before, even before you stepped out and created the heaven and the earth. And God, you, you purposed us for a great eternal purpose, God, in the ages to come, and it's just overwhelming. And Father, I pray as we continue to go through the book of Hebrews that our eyes would be open to, to understand your, your purpose and calling of the nation of Israel in the earthly places and to understand our fellowship in these things and the, in the heavenly ministration and the, 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 the heavenly government and the, the angelic ministry to the heirs of salvation one day, Father, just help us to comprehend the great fullness of your house, the great fullness of your government and administration and the, the fellowship that we have in it. God, teach us how to walk worthy of it, teach us to keep our eyes on the great hope of that calling, Lord, and to understand that these things are everlasting and what we do in the flesh and reap to the flesh will just only reap corruption. And God, I pray for everybody here that they would be kept safe on their way home, Lord, and that you'd bring them back safely Sunday morning. We ask it all in the holy and precious name of our great Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.